through person to person and out there on the internet and on Radio by Grace right now going across the country, uh, truly humbled by all of that. If, if I was just going to tag a little bit what Landry just shared with us, and you know that song there specifically talking about worship and our hearts before the Lord, but if I expanded that, haven't we in the first six months of this year of 2020 learned a lot of lessons about church and what we might have taken for granted and also what we might have very subtly made it into something bigger than it's supposed to be. And, and you know I love church and you, love, you know that I love doing everything we can to do this respectfully and with excitement and as real as we know how but the bottom line is God's people that know him worshiping him coming to his table honoring him being fed by his word filled by his spirit it's really not complicated and that we get to do that on Wednesday uh, prayer meeting, we're doing prayer meeting in the parking lot tomorrow night. We don't need the building. I like the building. Don't misunderstand. I like that we have the building, but we don't need the building. And uh, young adults met outside the building last night. And so I'm, I'm just saying, you know, uh, this whole 2020 <clears throat> has been the longest six months <laughs> of my life. It's only half over. It has to get better, right? We don't know. We don't know. But it's really good tonight. So if you're out there online, thank you for joining us, and you're together with us right now. If you're on Radio by Grace, you're together. The Holy Spirit's bigger than a building or a group of people, and I love that. And uh, if we make it to Sunday, and I say if we make it to Sunday, um, that's assuming the Lord doesn't come to take us home, okay? But if he does... Um, We'll have a great Sunday in, in heaven. But if we do, uh, we're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit, what it means to really be filled with the Holy Spirit practically. I could almost say true tongues, what tongues looks like. And don't, don't act like you know what that is. But I'm kind of giving a commercial for Sunday. I'm looking forward to that. Children's ministry will be back in place at least for 9 o'clock in the morning. So uh, uh, little by little, we got new people in the room tonight. Thank you for being here. And, and I, I just have to confess something. When I think about, okay, it's 2020 and all the things that's happened in my life and uh, looking back, it was 45 years ago. I got saved 48 years ago, but 45 years ago, I had something happen to me. I'd never, I mean, the, the craziest thing ever in my life, I, could, I couldn't believe that uh, I was going to preach my very first sermon 45 years ago. I didn't want to preach my first sermon. I was in Bible college. They made me do it. I was in a class called homiletics. And so anyways, uh, I, I, I had to. And they actually videotaped me way back then. The videotape machine was like this big and the camera and everything. But they videotaped. And I had to preach. I, I was never more afraid of anything in my life. You know, the, one of the biggest fears in life, one of the greatest fears is public speaking. And I was born with that fear. I went junior, through junior high and all the stuff in speech class, all that. I am convinced until I had my first sermon. And something happened. The Holy Spirit and a gift I didn't even know I had. And I still get really scared when I preach. Don't misunderstand. But, but I knew then, 45 years ago, and so did my professor and the other guys in the room, like, what happened to him? It, I don't know. It was God's gifting. So since then, of course, I've preached literally thousands and thousands of sermons. But I've also had the privilege in 45 years since not only to sit under other guys and the way they preach, but I've been able to train up guys and people that come into our church and they get saved and then a discipleship class that I get to do with them and then if I sense and they sense and then an opportunity for them to preach their very first sermon. You say, who's that going to be? The guy scared to death standing right over there. <laughs> ben Wade, if you'd come up here. <clears throat> so I'm going to let, let him tell you his story, but I'm going to pray for him. So 
I already told him, you know, I just told him, I said, everybody in the room loves you. Everybody in the room loves Jesus. Jesus loves you. And uh, did I tell you to have fun? He doesn't believe me about that, but anyways, in a sense. So we'll, we'll see. Now, don't grade him. We're not going to do any of that. We're just going to encourage him. We're going to pray right now for Ben. I guess I can do that that way. Social distancing. Yeah, yeah all that good stuff. <laughs> Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you know how to call us by name. And there I was way back in 1972, and Ben, with the story he's about to tell us, you know how to call us by name. And Father, you gave Ben and me and my friends here, you actually gave us to your son as a gift. And the Holy Spirit does that work in us, Lord, bringing faith and circumcising our heart. And yet in that whole process with your sovereignty and just everything that you've done in choosing us, Lord, predestinating us, we get to say yes. And when we say yes, it counts. It counts. That somewhere in that not so much a formula, it's a relationship. You orchestrated all of it. You're sovereign. But we get to say yes. And then we find out, Lord, that the Holy Spirit really does invade our lives and seals us till the day of promise. But he brings to us a very special gift. Nobody else has it. Oh, there might be others, Lord, with the gift of prophecy or foretelling or teaching and shepherding. I, I, I understand that. But the way you gifted me is unique in proportion. My personality, somehow, the things I've learned through life, somehow that enters into it, but it's that gifting. And so I thank you that Ben is willing to not just be saved not just to sit in church, not just to serve, Lord, using his, obviously he's got the gift of hospitality and just being a servant, Lord. But I pray tonight that whether he has like the gift or not, I know you're going to honor your word. I know you're going to honor his testimony. So we pray together that you would surprise Ben. Mm -hmm. Surprise him. And that, Lord, somehow in the middle of all of this, he would have fun finding out how the Holy Spirit really does show up when you need him. At the same hand, Lord, I pray you'd surprise all the listeners, the people in the room, his family in the room, people out there on the internet, radio, that you would surprise them, that the Holy Spirit working in all of our hearts, I pray that I would be surprised at your truth, your calling, and your love again for us. So we thank you, Lord. We give you, Ben, and this service for your glory, and that only Jesus would receive the honor and glory. It's in his name we'd ask. Amen. Have fun, buddy. I feel like I just got to the top of the roller coaster, and I look, <laughs> and we're going, going down, but in a good way. Um, let me take a drink of water right quick, y'all. listening to a sermon about Moses. And when God called Moses, he said, oh, I can't do it. I can't talk. You know, and he gave all these excuses why he couldn't do it. And God said, I'll be with you. And so right there in my car driving, listening to Tony Evans, I said, God, use me however you want me, however you want to use me. Um, I don't want to be like Moses where I make excuses. Eight o'clock the next morning, Pastor Bill calls me and says, hey, can you preach? So God answers prayers, and he sometimes do it, does it really quickly, and that's a true story. Um, to take the stage here at Grace Church, um, we've got men like Pastor Bill. We have Doug, Doug Jr., Asher, Michael Boyles. He comes out of nowhere, that guy. Good grief. Nate, Nick, Scott, Flex. Um, and God's not calling me to be them um, although there's that tendency where I want to, you know, be them, but God's not calling us to do that. The common denominator in everybody that takes the stage here at Grace Church is the, the Holy Bible, the authority of God's word, the love for Christ, um, the love for his finished work. 
So I'm praying tonight that you let God's word renew you, replenish you, and restore your mind, okay? So um, we're going to be in the book of Romans tonight, and we all know that Paul wrote Romans, but no human, not even one who so faithfully preached the gospel as Paul did, has ever led anybody, anyone, has never had the ability to open anyone's heart. Jesus Christ can only do that. Uh, we can sow the word, but the Holy Spirit is responsible for the harvest. So I would ask you, humbly submit to you tonight, you guys, let the, let the Holy Spirit dialogue with your heart. Um, hardening of our spiritual arteries is detrimental, it's counterproductive, and it's problematic. So really let the Holy Spirit talk to you tonight. We're going to be in Romans. It's very, very deep water. Um, there's a lot there. So here we go. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and read the scripture. It's Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 32. Uh, would you stand with me to honor God's word? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For it is in the righteousness of God, it is in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God, ha God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse." Because all they, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil, evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you, that your word would do what you want it to do tonight, Lord. I just pray that you would calm my heart and my speech, Lord. I pray that you would move me out of the way. I pray that you would bless my friends and my family here tonight. Lord, I just, we just love you. Um, we know that you accomplished everything on the cross. Lord, I just pray that you would just move amongst your people tonight. For it's in your holy, precious name I pray. Amen. Y'all can sit down. I am going to use the New King James Version, but I also printed off a copy of the New Living Translation because I really like the conversational style English that it is, so I may bounce back and forth, okay? So um, really my testimony kind of begins with Romans in a lot of ways. Uh, that's where I saw myself before a holy God, and that holy God came to seek and save me. Um, I never knew Jesus until I experienced his grace, um, you may know this, but there's, there's no grace in religion. There's no grace in ritual. There's no get grace in tradition. Um, a lot of times we just have that outward code of behavior that we measure ourselves by. But I just prayed tonight that we'll walk in the spirit and 
just really realize that Christ accomplished everything. And it's an unmerited gift. It's not by our works. Um, after all, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He doesn't say he was a truth. He is the truth. He is the way, and then he is the life. Um, there's a study tool that I came up or that I, I read, and I've shared it with a, the college class before. Uh, Christ is the, the overarching theme, theme of the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. He's the meta narrative. It's all, it all points to him. Every single book, all the scriptures. So to see Christ in scripture, we have the Old Testament where he's predicted. We have the four gospels where Christ is revealed. We have the book of Acts where Christ is first preached. We have the epistles where Christ is explained. And we have revelation where Christ is expected. Um, and if you're like me, the way my mind works when I'm approaching the Bible, I kind of have to know the history and the context. So the book of Romans, why is Romans called Romans? Um, what's the historical context? Who's the author? It's written to the Christian church in Rome, probably around 57 AD. Um, they had suffered some persecution, but it was a cosmopolitan church, multicultural, multi-ethnic, uh, multilingual, all different socioeconomic levels. Um, all different social class strata. So it would probably be like modern-day New York or, or London or Paris. Um, Romans is written in the style of prose discourse. It's a letter. He's writing to a, a certain audience. Um, he usually wrote to churches that he had established throughout uh, Asia Minor and uh, the Middle East. But the Roman church was different. Um, there was already Christians there, and he had never met them. He was planning on visiting visiting them but, um, on the way to possibly evangelizing Spain. So, and he wouldn't even arrive in, uh, in excuse me, he wouldn't arrive in Rome until three years later as a prisoner. So, um, some people have called Romans the gospel according to Paul. He boldly proclaimed it for his entire life. Paul uses the term gospel 16 times in Romans. Um, Gospel means, of course, good news or the, the good message of Christ. Um, the good news is it's more than just a theology to be pondered. It's also uh, a life to be lived. So Romans chapter 1, the verses 16 and 17, they constitute a thesis statement. It's the epistle in a nutshell, the crux of his teaching. So we're going to start with 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For it is the righteousness, it is in the righteousness of God, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Salvation only works by faith. Uh, faith itself is a gift from God. It's grace. And if you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, just I want that to really hit home. It's all about grace. Um, Jesus is God's grace. The truths in Romans can revive right thinking and they can in right living. So uh, there's a mirrored verse that I like, uh, Ephesians 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It kind of mirrors the 16 through 17. It is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It is a gift of God, not of works, least, lest any man should boast. The New Living Translation says, Salvation is not a reward for the good we have done, so none of us can boast about it. I think that's pretty straightforward. Like I said, grace is, is unmerited favor. It's God's favor to man. There's nothing you can do to deserve it. Um, let me see the first picture, Patricia, please. I want to kind of show. <laughs> I'm thinking about bringing the turtleneck back. <laughs> okay, I want to kind of show a difference. Uh, I didn't really realize God's grace until I got older, but I started out, I had a great life. Can I see the second picture? That's <laughs> Okay. 
Then the next picture, please, Patricia. Now, that's me in high school with all my little things here. <laughs> I wanted to show you those pictures because I wanted you to know I had a great life, great childhood, great parents, um, pretty much kind of a squeaky clean outside. But I never, I never truly grasped grace. I never really had time for Jesus. I was kind of, you know, as a kid caught up in churchianity, I would show up and kind of look the part. Um, to me, Jesus was kind of just fire insurance. Like I just kept him, you know, with the thought that oh, I don't want to go to hell, but I don't really want to submit to anything that he has, you know, to offer. So, um, and if you've ever noticed in the Gospels, it often seems like those who live the worst kind of lives were the first to come to Christ. And while those who appeared to live moral lives, they just weren't interested in his salvation. Like the woman at the well, John chapter 4. But we know that, that Jesus, he comes to seek and save the lost. He comes to find us. Um, like those pictures showed, I don't know if you can tell from a picture, but I, I understood right and wrong. Um, I was more concerned about me and my comfort, my convenience, my wants, kind of my ego, and my life, my happiness, my happiness. It was all, you know, kind of focused on me. Um, back to verses 18 through 32, uh, we're going to show how Paul establishes the scope of the problem, uh, the reality of our guilt. It's an indictment against humanity. So this, all, this applies to every single one of us. He addresses both the Jew and the Gentile. And the categorical language on the reality of our sin illustrates and confirms Roman 1 is universal. It's not partisan. It's all inclusive rather than exclusive. All are in rebellion against God and practice unrighteousness. And that's a hard truth to hear. But it's, it's applicable to all of us. And that's why grace sounds so good. Romans 1 goes against our modern cultural norms. Um, but tonight, we're going to be held responsible. I'm going to be held responsible in this passage. Um, the main question is, does everyone sin? And we all know the answer to that is yes. So it's one of two answers. So it's okay? Or is everyone in trouble? It's important to see sin as God sees it, not as a character flaw or a setback, but a terminal condition. And I had to see sin as God does before I understood, understood and was grateful for grace. Romans says later on in chapter 3, we are justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Romans 1 is my aha moment, y'all. This is where it really, it really hit home for me. Um, I saw myself before a holy God, and I saw how wonderful grace truly is and what Jesus did on the cross, how significant of an event that is for humanity. So when we read the Bible tonight, we want to we wanna look at, number one, what is revealed about the God that we serve. And then number two, how is this applicable in my life? Let's go ahead and jump in here. Verses 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attribute, attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things." We do know that mankind does, in fact, suppress the truth of God. Um, every truth that's ever been revealed to man by God has been fought against, disregarded, and deliberately obscured. We silence the truth speakers, 
in our society marginalizes them. Um, we just don't, our, our society doesn't want to hear it, you know. Um, I don't know if you've ever encountered that, but you probably will if you live as a Christian and if you're walking it out, people are going to look at you like you're goofy or kind of like you checked your mind at the door and you just, you don't have any intellect anymore, <laughs> which is further from the truth. Um, and God's moral and ethical standard is written on our hearts. And when we violate that standard, that's when our conscience is engaged. So you know, you all know that feeling. You were born with, you know, nobody had to tell you that murder was wrong. Nobody had to, you just knew it. Stealing was wrong, beating up your little brother, um, <laughs> lying to your parents, uh, breaking stuff. You just, <laughs> you knew, uh-oh. And that's God's, it's woven into the fabric of every human being. We're given reason, and we're given morality as our two spiritual senses. Um, we can think things through, and we know, like I said, we know, we know morals. Uh, morals isn't, morality isn't dictated. It's not a social construct. It's God's imprint on our hearts, revealed in God's word, too. And we can't plead ig ignorance. Um, also, what this, this passage speaks of is creation speaks of God's glory. And you know, when you sunrises, sunsets, nature, the intricacies of our human body, red blood cells, they still baffle scientists. scientists. I don't know if you've ever gotten into that, but check it out. <laughs> um, our DNA strands, you know, everything is just coded in there. That's just remarkable. There's intelligent design. The universe is full of evidence of divine and intelligent design. Um, as a matter of fact, when Paul evangelized the Gentiles in the book of Acts, chapter 17, he, he pointed to creation, and he pointed to morality, and he pointed to the differences in our personalities as evidence. Um, the great, the, the Mars Hill uh, passage, Acts chapter 17, and when Paul would, would preach the gospel to the Jews, he would go back to the Old Testament, but to the Gentiles, which is the category we fall in, unless you're Jewish in here, I don't know. He, he would point to creation to point out the reality of God. Um, and in our culture, sometimes sociology and anthropology get elevated above theology, but that's wrong. We should always, look, should always come back, funnel back to God and his truths. Um, in verses 21, 22, and 23... Hold on, I got a snafu here, sorry. Okay. Because they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore... Okay, without grace in the Holy Spirit, we refuse to worship God or even acknowledge him. So it's absolutely essential that we constantly, constantly compare our own conception of God against the reality of who God is as revealed in, in his word. Um, we attempt to define God by ourselves as the metric. Uh, do we measure God by man or do we measure man by God? Claiming to be smart we redefine his attributes and his laws, too. Uh, we've supplanted God with ourselves. We reinvent the wheel with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense. That's rampant in our culture. And when we do that, it's just easier to live philosophies and ideologies that don't challenge our lifestyle. That's what it boils down to. Idolatry is rampant. Um, we reinforce our own biases. We remove God and, in turn, you know, it creates a vacuum that we fill with our achievements. We worship race. Um, if you put black before God, that's disproportionate. If you put white above God, that's just the wrong, the wrong way to look at it. We worship class. We worship power. We worship position, freedom. We worship politics. We worship health, sports. Celebrity, music, books, technology, education, 
academics and social media. And basically what that boils down to is our pride. We don't, we don't want to worship God. We want to put these things that are more convenient and easier in his place. Um, Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Let's move on to 20, verse 24 through 27. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, uncleanness, in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. This shows when God's restraining grace is removed. Um, sin is the reason, sin is the result, sin is the cause, and sin is the consequence. Uh, this just highlights when the natural is traded for the unnatural or a counterfeit. If a counterfeit exists, then there mean that, there mean, that means that there has to be an original. So we know what God, God's word says um, but saying that, we also know that the, on the other end of sin is a human being. So we need to walk, walk through this with grace and dignity, show people respect. And like I said, this, was, this is a God-ordained. Uh, Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And we were designed for a complementary relationship with the opposite sex. Um, like I said, it's God designed, God ordained. And if you start jumping fences, you need to ask the question, why is that fence there in the first place? And just remember all, all of these from verses 18 all the way through till I finish, Jesus Christ took all this on the cross. He paid the penalty for all of this. So keep that, keep that in your hearts. There's a verse I really love. It says, Lord, hide your... Hide your word on my heart so I may not sin against you. So just remember Jesus Christ took all of this. Verses 28. Sorry, I need to hold the microphone right here. Okay. Verses 28 through 32. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do they do the same, but they approve of those who practice them. And the New Living Translation says, worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. <sighs> Patricia, can I see the last picture? That's, that's me five years ago. Um, idolatry is a downward spiral for sure. Uh, I knew God, but like I said, I failed to glorify him. I wanted to be my own God. And you know the lie of this culture, live your own truth. I rejected knowledge of him. I worshiped myself and chemicals. And as ashamed of that picture that I am, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Just like Paul says in verse 16. So kind of without that picture, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have known him as, as deeply and as intensely, and I wouldn't be as dependent on Christ. Um, and I will say this, self-pity is very lethal. I wallowed in self-pity for a long time. Those first pictures that I showed you kind of showed 
how my life started out and how I'd brushed aside God's grace and kind of disregarded it and dismissed it. And Romans 1, 18 through 32 shows a life that's dismissal of God's grace that doesn't live in the truth of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But I would encourage you tonight that if you're following your heart, um, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And we, we often have a, a standard. We think that, that we're good, but the standard is set so high by God. In, in, in Mark chapter 10, there's a young man that comes up to Jesus, and he says, uh, Teacher, what must I do to be saved? Or good teacher. And Jesus answered the man. He says, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus loved that man. But when he told that man that no one is good but God alone, that man wanted to answer and tell him all the commandments that he had kept. God himself, Jesus Christ, told him, no one is good but me. And don't we do that? We try to, we try to say, well, I follow this rule or I follow that rule or, you know, I'm not as bad as that person. But God sets the standard. Um, just remember tonight that grace, grace always calls us back to verses 16 and 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, or I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. The good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. And that's actually Habakkuk 2.4. Guys, I just want you to remember it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. I, I hope you didn't hear me browbeat you tonight. And I know this is shorter than what I thought it was going to be, so we might be getting out of church a little bit early tonight. <laughs> but listen, Jesus, Jesus made a way the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit will help you. Um, when I look at that, that old picture of myself, I see grace and I see the cross. And I hope that you, you have a moment like that in, in your life. And if you don't, make tonight, today's the day of salvation. If you don't, you know, Jesus is always calling us. And when I look at that picture, I, I see that's what my Savior took that for me on the cross. So look back to the cross Look forward to his return and look inward for the application of his word. So, and I just want to encourage you too with Galatians 5.22. Um, Jade and I, I have a, we have a handwritten note in our kitchen to remind us that we need to walk in the fruit of the spirit, which is love, which is joy, which is peace, which is long-suffering, which means patience. I don't know if anybody... If, Patience is kind of hard when you're married, but the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Just on Jada's end, I mean, you know. <laughs> she gets the whole full Ben Wade experience all the time. So Y'all pat her on the back when she leaves. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit is kindness, goodness, self-control. And just, that's so encouraging to me to know that we can walk in, in the Spirit. That, you know, we don't, our flesh accounts for nothing. His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient for us. Um, so there's a couple of questions. Do you look back? Do you see sin as God defines it? Do you know you need a Savior? That might be the biggest question of the night. Do you know that you need a Savior? Romans 1, 16 through 32 says you do. Do you see others as a menace or a ministry? And does self-inventory anger you when you're forced to put that microscope that you use on everybody else when you put it on yourself does it make you mad and if the answer is yes then maybe you need to do some self-inventory maybe you need to let God do his work do his work in you will you do it and in closing I'd like to see the verse in Psalms Psalm 32 verse 5 Finally, I confessed, confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. 
I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. And you know who wrote Psalm 32? It was David. And you remember the story of David? He's a man after God's own heart. But David also had sex with his best friend's wife. He lusted after her. He got her pregnant. And then he had her husband murdered. So he knew He knew what it was to walk in his own flesh. But he also knew God's grace and God's unmerited favor. Um, David approached the Lord with a, a broken and a contrite heart, which is acceptable to the Lord. He, he wants us to come to him humbly. And the word contrite, we don't hear that very often anymore, but it means to be crushed or sometimes thoroughly crushed, to be dejected, to be broken, to be beaten to pieces or broken into pieces, to be bruised or to be humbled. And I would just encourage you tonight that, like I said, if you don't know Jesus Christ, then, then tonight's the night. Um, the gospel is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. And I want to I wanna read you a little devotional that I read probably maybe a month after that picture was taken, that last picture. Um, if you remember... When David was confronted with his sin, God had sent the prophet Nathan to, to tell him a kind of a parable about a man um, being murdered for his land. And, and of course, David was, or uh, yeah, David heard it and he was, he was angered by it. But in reality, that story was about him uh, killing Bathsheba's husband. And this is called When Nathan the Prophet Went to Him. It's in Psalms 51. No shouts. No pointed fingers, no flashing eyes, no red-faced accusations, no inflammatory vocabulary, no bulging forehead veins, no derogatory names, no scary threats, no arrows of guilt, no cornering logic, no how dare you, no I can't believe you would, no what were you thinking, no public confrontation, no published rebuke, no arrest warrant, no handcuffs, no leading away to be charged, no list of crimes, no human tricks, no trying to do God's work, no hope of forcing a turning, no confidence in the power of man, no human manipulation, no political posturing, no, none of these. Just a humble prophet telling a simple story a sinner with a sinner, not standing above, alongside together, wanting to be an instrument, hoping to assist a blind man to see, but no trust in self, speaking calmly, speaking simply, and letting God do it through a familiar example, painted with plain words, what only God can do. Crack the hard shell heart of a wayward man, and make it feel again, see again, cry again, pray again, plead again, hope again, love again, commit again to a new and a better way. Not the legacy of self-righteous, impatient, condemning, I'm better than you anger, but the harvest of a man of grace, giving grace to a man who doesn't deserve grace, but won't live again without it. If you don't know Jesus Christ tonight, let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. Um, I would just encourage you to do, like I said, the self-inventory and um, be face-to-face -face with your creator. Um, he can totally change your life, change your world. I'm proof of that. So, all right, let's pray, y'all. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for tonight, Lord. Um, I know it may have gone a little quicker than had expected, but Lord, I, I'm, I know that your word went out and it won't, it won't return void. Lord, I just pray for my friends here that may not know you, Lord. I pray that you would hear their cries and that you would meet them where they are. 
And, Lord, just do a, do a work in their hearts tonight. Um, Lord, we love you. I just pray that we would have our identity in you, Lord, and that we would rest in your finished work. Trust in you. Trust in your ways, Lord. I just pray that you'd give us sweet sleep tonight, Lord, and bless our city, bless our nation. For it's in your holy, precious name. Amen.